Hi everyone. We asked a question in the last video about a boat. Well, it, I didn't say it was a boat even. I just said, what is a starvationer? And we were absolutely amazed by how many responses came back. <laughs> we don't normally get loads and loads of, of comments like that. And I thought, well, I'll put some a bit more what they call meat on the bone and give you a bit more information about these uh, these boats so all those years ago bear in mind now we're talking 1760s uh, but before that the industrial revolution had just started to take off in the UK uh, we know the Sankey Canal that uh, did a, had a version of uh, of loading boats up and taking coal and and things because uh, that was the first industrial canal. We look a little bit ahead and we talk about the Bridgewater Canal. Now the Duke of Bridgewater, he wanted to provide coal or did provide coal to these emerging places, you know, Manchester and all the surrounding areas. He had to supply coal. But the thing is in those days, there was no roads as such, it was all rough terrain and it was horse and cart, what they used to put coal in. Very slow method and basically couldn't keep up with demand. So, he had a little bit of a thought, got a few uh, designers in and that as well. And um, they come up with the Bridgewater Canal. But that was the easy part for me, <laughs> doing the Bridgewater Canal. It was all the other bits at a place called Worsley and or Worsley Delf where the mines were what the Duke of Bridgewater owned. Now I've my dad was a miner and I've always just thought of mines, lifts going down to the coal face and that's it. Nothing like that then. <laughs> Dear me, nothing at all. These mines were quite unique. There was 46 miles of subterranean canal and down there was a lot of coal but it was a very inefficient way of trying to get it. So they come up with a few ideas and the most successful idea was this starvationer. Now these boats were narrow, they were the forerunners uh, for the working boats and the narrow boats you know today. People took their ideas from this. And without the starvationers, it's unlikely that we had, we'd have the canal network we have today. So they're considered to be of extreme importance in the history of canals. Anyway, these boats. They were built in three sizes carrying a weight of coal ranging from 2 ton to 12 ton. The larger ones, they 
took the call to the likes of Manchester, Salford in Manchester and the likes. Imagine from going from a cart over all this terrain to going up a canal, 12 tonne of coal and being able to take it up very quickly because it was a lot quicker than the Arthur cart then. It was a revolution, it really was. So, that's the larger ones. The smaller ones had to go down into these mines. Now these were around 30 foot by 3 foot 6, the small starvationers. And they could carry around 2 ton of coal. So how did they get it down there? Well, these canals... What they had in, in the design, it was on two levels inside and there was an inclined plane as well. So this all seems so advanced when you think we're in the 1760s. Uh, these boats, they had to be taken down to the coal face or very close. And men and young boys used to put these boats together, put a few together go to the mine, burning mine, no electric, candle light, absolutely the thought of what the conditions must be like, oh dear me, but they had to get them down, how did they do it? Well they had the, the boats all together, but in the roof of, uh, of these mines there was rings and they used to put ropes through the rings and pull the boats along to take them down because they were empty so they were obviously they weren't as heavy even though I could, I could still think thick oak boats like that must still <laughs> weigh a heck of a lot <laughs> and, oh, so it's unbelievable to think every time I go into this and my mind explodes sometimes but they had to get them down there now some of these mines and tunnels where they're going were very very low so at that point they had to do something what the old working boats similar to what the old working boats used to do in tunnels where there was no uh, tow paths they had to lie on the back and walk these boats by putting the feet on the roof as they're going along now that's like an early form of legging which uh, they used to use in the tunnels when you used to get two guys back to back and they walk the meet the the uh, working boats along in the tunnels well this is this is a similar idea but I would imagine it's a hundred times harder so that's how it all started now there's more to come and as I'm showing you there's uh, I've, I've been lucky enough to got to get some footage from the National Waterways Museum at Ellesmere Port recommended for anybody to go and if you want to expand your knowledge, go and have a look. You know, you can, plenty of people just visit Luke and say, oh yeah, it's a boat. But if you're interested in history and you read a little bit, it is extremely, extremely good. So that's the first part. And I'll go on to the, the next section and uh, tell you what happens once the boat reaches the coal face. We're now at that position where you're wondering how those starvationers can get down safely into the mines and get back. I'll try to explain. Because you've got bird in mind, like I've said before, this is the 1760s. When these boats were empty, and like I've said, uh, these are approximately 30 foot by 3 foot 6. You know, they, they, this, you said they're small, but they're still a, a fair weight and distance in solid, you know, and, and size in a solid oak boat. But they used to, the empty ones, were, there was a few strapped together. And before they went in the mine, it was the responsibility of... A man or a young lad to make certain these are all secured together 
and then they enter the mine. It must have been horrendous. You know, candlelight only doing this and the conditions. Oh. Whew. Eh? None of us should ever moan, I'll tell you. Dear me, the thought. So he, after all that work, getting, um, getting down there, the next thing is they need to get out. This was ingenious. And I, I, I find it mind-blowing when you think of what, what period of history it was. These small boats held about two tonne of coal each time. And then they had to get them out. How did they do it? Well, all this water, to keep it you know, flowing and keep safe, they had sluice gates. And that was used for drainage as well. But just imagine one of these boats is brought along, then the sluice gates lifted and all the water behind that sluice gate starts to come up. It's not running, it's now coming up. Similar, again, to a lock. But this is a bit rougher, this method. <laughs> I could imagine if you were on a narrowboat doing this method. <laughs> but this water lifts up. So you've got, behind the boat, you've now got a head of water. And what did they do? They slowly open the sluice and the water shoots out underneath and propels the starvationer. And it goes along and when come to the next sluice, the exact same thing again. Let it flood behind, open up, propels. It is ingenious. And they did that all the way to the... Uh, outside till it propels them out into the uh, into the light again how good how good is that absolutely incredible and from that point <clears throat> the logical thing happened and it would probably be done by hand using shovels and that from the two ton boats they were loaded into the 12 ton boats and that quickly made or quickly in them days made its way to the to Manchester and the surrounding towns to drive the Industrial Revolution. The other thing it did, it made the Duke of Bridgewater one of the richest men in all the world. So that little boat, so much history, incredible isn't it? Just before this video is finished, I just want to just tell you a little bit about a part of the bridge water what well it was just so important when the bridge water opened in 1761 a aqueduct was built an arch aqueduct uh, it was it was designed by James Brindley the famous engineer and that took the boats, you know, the starvationers and all that over, over the valley and allowed them to get to Manchester to deliver the coal. And that lasted for quite a while. But progress took over. You know, just things happened and... The Manchester Ship Canal was built. Now it all had to change then because the ships coming through were massive and they were too big or they would be too big to go under the aqueduct. James Brinley's urged aqueduct had to be demolished but it was quite a few years hence. In 1893 until 1894, they built the Swing Aqueduct, the only one in existence in all the world. And that allowed boat traffic to go up and down the newly constructed 
Manchester Ship Canal. It had a great, you know, it was a, it was a great design. And that is how it's it's like today. And it's mechanical. It's the Barton Swing Bridge swinging back. So anytime soon, hopefully, we'll be crossing. think about it if that ever became faulty was stuck open or it couldn't be used for any reason the Bridgewater Canal is cut in two it really is and it makes a difference today it would make huge difference if we lost that that aqueduct it would make a huge difference to to boaters uh, in the modern era it would have done then as well but the only way you could get round as an example this say to the Liverpool link the only way you could do that you only had a few choices you could go through Pomona Lock as you're on your way to Castlefield going up to Manchester and that takes you down onto the Manchester Ship Canal and you would have to go on to the Mersey and make your way over to the docks at Liverpool. That's all well and good, but not everybody wants to do that. And a narrowboat would have to have a certificate of seaworthiness if it wanted to do that. So it's and you need all your your life jackets, etc., all your radios and everything. So you've got to. It's a lot of messing about. So that's one way you could do it. The other way, which. I think the vast majority of people would would have to do they would go round they'd have to go round through Castlefield onto the Rochdale Canal or the Uddersfield Narrows and come straight through into Yorkshire all the way round onto the Leeds Liverpool and come back down onto the uh, Bridgewater towards uh, Wigan now, again, that's all well and good, but it, besides it taking quite a long time instead of the, that five minute trip, <laughs> what was, what's missing, that little bit would be missing. The problem they'd have there as well is they have restricted uh, narrowboat lengths on the Leeds Liverpool and a few other canals going round. Um, and if your boat is over 60 foot that's it there's not much chance really you're going to be uh, you being unable to go uh, straight round because your boat would be too long there is a few lengths and all around that area the, the 70 foot very limited 62 foot in a few places and 60 foot can get more or less everywhere on that journey it says 58 but if you if you put the boat across in a, in a wide lock you can get 60 but it, it's it's a bit awkward so it'd have a huge impact 
So I just thought I'd tell you that, that piece of, you know, that construction, that metal construction, I don't know how well maintained it is, if that goes, mega problems. So it's something where I think should have been, um, you know, really looked after because I'd hate it if we ever lost something like that because it would have a huge impact on our cruising routes. Anyway, I just thought I'd push that one in as well, so you, you could just try to understand it. I hope the little maps and, and that what we did give you an understanding of that. But that's it. Um, next time, I think we're back on pre-lockdown pre uh, cruises in the next one, because we've still got quite a bit to do there. I've got other plans as well for other vlogs, uh, why the... Uh, cruising is so limited at the moment but we've got a few things to come for you to enjoy well that's definitely it for now and uh, I think uh, me and Bernadette will, go, will be going to doing what uh, a lot of people do these days we're going to find something on Netflix and sit down and have a bit of escapism I think something on the uh, on the films there but for now, that is it. But we'll definitely back, be back soon. We hope you stay well, stay safe. And uh, all I can say is, ta -ra.